Hey, it's Jordan. I am here uh, joined by Conrad Shaw, a documentary filmmaker who has done a lot of work, actually, the last few years on universal basic income. Uh, obviously, uh, I've covered uh, Andrew Yang, who I've invited on and hasn't taken me up on it, so still, still an option for Mr. Yang. Uh, I've covered uh, Andrew Yang basically pointing out I'm, I'm the, I actually like the concept of universal basic income. I just don't like his version, and I don't like some of his kind of defeatist rhetoric, but I wanted to, uh, with Conrad to go further into universal basic income just as, a, as a, a policy because you've actually, through documentary filmmaker, kind of had some guinea pigs to see how this works put into pr practice. Can you kind of explain for the audience uh, what, you're, what you've been working on? Uh, how does that uh, work as far as universal basic income? Uh, yeah, um, so my wife Daya and I decided um, about three years ago we were going to work on a documentary together and we had become taken by this idea of universal basic income as a way to really or as an important subject and also a way to really tell good human stories and our our concept was that basic income the whole movement has historically been very techy very academic uh, it kind of came back into the public awareness through you know um, a lot of like tech billionaires talking about it and a lot of what made Andrew Yang's campaign take off is that side of things you know UBI as a response to automation uh, but through all my research and interviewing a lot of people we found that um, you know before it was a tech thing it was a human rights thing you know Martin Luther King was fighting for UBI before he died uh, Thomas Paine was pushing like a version of UBI um, and it's a bipartisan thing uh, and the two questions you always come to in, in the movement so so human rights is a big part of what's missing in the dialogue of the movement of the movement um, and the two questions you always come to uh, in the movement are one how do you pay for it like is it going to be on the backs of the middle class and the poor or whatever um, and the other is what will people actually do with money the human nature question so with the documentary, we set out to um, explore, investigate the human nature question. And the best way to do that is not to have experts talking about it. It's to actually see it in action. So it, it took us a couple of years, but we, we cobbled together through a Kickstarter type thing and a bunch of donors um, and a, a UBI trial that is the most geographically diverse UBI trial that's, to my knowledge, in, in US history. Um, it spans 10 states. There are 21 different people, you know, individuals, families. It's 11 stories in total. And they are receiving basic incomes with no strings attached for two years. Um, the trial is, we staggered them in. There are some people that just ended this week, actually, and some people that have until June. Uh, but we're filming constantly for two years, and we want to release a series that shows basically what they do with the basic income how it impacts them, you know, from just an honest objective, you know, fly on the wall lens, uh, and we want to release those in 2020 to get the get the people talking. And um, how much did each family get? Uh, so it wasn't on a per family basis. Uh, a, a true universal basic income should be per individual, mm -hmm. which is really important for women's empowerment. Um, like if a woman's got to get away from an abusive husband, um, so. Um, we did $1,000 per adult per month, and we did uh, $333 per kid per month. But we, we actually did it on a weekly basis. Uh, and, after, you know, most things, most of them do it on a monthly basis these days, but I've worked enough low-end jobs or even a bi-weekly check, and you're struggling at the end of the two weeks, or people are. So in my mind, the more frequency, the better. So that was one way we designed our trial differently than a lot of people did. And um, kind of obviously, it's eleven stories. But what are some of the patterns you've seen as far as um, you know economic relief, uh, new opportunities for people with the, with those funds? What are some of the what you've seen? Well, I'm not going to get too deep into spoilers. Yeah. Uh, but in general, we have people from homeless to solidly middle class, all different sorts of issues from indigenous rights, trans rights, you know. Uh, immigration, um, criminal record, drug history. Um, 
and you know, we came into it this is a scientific investigation this is not a pitch you know this is just an exploration but we came into it somewhat optimistic you know I'm, I'm an, a UBI advocate myself and but we exp we embrace scary stories like people with drug addiction history and things like that so we are open to telling the good and the bad of what happens and I will say that um, the effect of UBI on people's lives even in a short-term trial uh, is very dramatic and very um, quick it, the, the extent to which people were taking action in their lives I think was something that was really surprising to me like you give people some sort of avenue to feel like they can plan the other thing is just how much more aware and engaged in the, the actual finances of their lives people became there are a lot of things we deal with in our lives that like your student debt or your your mortgage or whatever whatever you're falling behind on it's not something that you really if you don't really see an easy way to deal with it then what you end up doing is you ignore it we all do it's like you know what I'm gonna think about this when I have a job when I'm above water uh, and then it just gets pushed and pushed and pushed and that's how we live paycheck to paycheck for the rest of our lives so it's really cool to see people who aren't in that exact same paradigm and how it plays out you've studied the issue obviously so what do you say because uh, to me, Yang in particular, um, he's talking about how his plan fundamentally raises the minimum wage, so you don't have to actually raise the minimum wage because this is, in effect, a minimum wage raise. But he's also kind of talked about, um, it seems to be like trade-offs. You take the UBI, but you can't be on uh, certain uh, entitlement programs, uh, which I could fi I find problematic because some people with the different entitlement programs they're on amounts to uh, just about what he's proposing as far as a thousand dollars a month, and then there's people uh, who rail against UPI because there's no price controls on the supplier side, so wouldn't they just raise the prices of things? Uh, what have you found in your research of that? Um, okay, so there's two things there. Uh, one with the minimum wage. It's a fair argument, and uh, it's a very powerful argument that a UBI is essentially a minimum wage hike. Like on a forty-hour-a-week basis, it's about six bucks an hour, uh, and on a like if you're working part-time, it's like twelve bucks an hour. Um, is one way to think of it. Uh, I don't think Andrew specifically says, I, and I'm sort of of the same mindset that uh, it's not necessarily precluding minimum wages. It's just saying this is a much more powerful thing we can do to help out everyone, make sure no one's missed. Minimum wage has a lot of good things going for it. You know, there's basically people who are working have a much more reliable source of income, um, and uh, it puts positive pressure on all the incomes in the lower end uh, to go up as well as competition rises. Um, but UBI does that as well, and also UBI doesn't miss people that are unemployed for whatever reason for however long um, and it affects everyone uh, significantly it, whereas if you're making $14 an hour and your minimum wage gets bumped to 15 that's a dollar an hour maybe a little more with positive upward pressure so those people would be getting six effectively under a UBI if you're making 20 maybe it gets pushed up a little maybe it doesn't but you're, you're getting six with a UBI you know, minus a, a small amount in the lower brackets that go back to the tax mechanisms that are funding UBI. But essentially, you're helping everyone at the bottom and no one gets missed. Um, so for, for me, I would say we do both. You know, we, we put in a UBI and then we decide where a, 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 an appropriate minimum wage should be. 15 sounds reasonable to me. Um, welfare trade-offs. Um, so one thing I think people really need to understand is the extent to which welfare sucks. Welfare sucks today. It's better than nothing, and this is why, you know, I've always uh, aligned more Democrat and liberal, and this is why we hold on to it, because it, it's at least something for people that need it, right? But it's extremely humiliating. It's extremely burdensome. It misses a lot of people. It's something like 
I forget which program, but it's like one in five people who are supposed to qualify actually do, and the people that do, it's not enough. It's burdensome. It's like it's at the moment when you're most taxed and your kids are hungry and you're about to get evicted that you have to go stand in line, jump through hoops, show that you're going through vocational training. It's just awful. It's awful. And so some of this um, this pushback I see from from very progressive type people who I align with a lot that you know we're not you should stack it with certain welfare programs because why would you help some people more than others? doesn't totally make sense to me as long as as long as we're replacing it with a UBI that's of greater or equal or greater value and also that money is coming without conditions and people can use it for whatever they want and it's permanent and there's no extra hassles and bureaucratic hoops to jump through it's significantly better for anyone and to say that people currently on welfare should keep those certain means tested types of welfare specifically food stamps temporary assistance for needy families the, the the main the main ones that like Andrew's talking about replacing, um, that's like saying you know we have this we have this crappy program that somewhat a little bit helps maybe one out of the five people it's trying to help and lifts them to a point where they're kind of stuck because they can't take work or they'll lose their benefits so they have all these poverty ceilings and welfare cliffs that they're dealing with and so. We had this program we tried to put in place. It's not very good, but it helps a few people some, right? And if we're going to replace that, we better make sure that we're helping those people who were lucky enough to get that bad help as much as the people who were missed entirely or the people just above the welfare cliff. And that, in turn, would be unfair for the, for the people who didn't have the welfare to stack it with, right? But if, if you look at it and if you actually talk to people that are on welfare and say, would you rather have... Usually it's way less than $1,000, by the way, uh, what you're getting in these benefits as you're getting them for that temporary amount of time, or would you rather have $1,000 for the rest of your life every single month unconditionally without thinking about it? You have your time, you have your agency, you have everything you need. Um, I don't think they're going to be so worried, and I find that they're not so worried about like the guy making $10,000 more is also getting something as people who are speaking out on their defense saying that's not fair it's like it's 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 really people that aren't the one like in a lot of cases it's really the people that aren't the ones that are affected by this argument who are i think misguidedly standing up for the people that are on these welfare programs could an argument be made though that if you do stack it so because fundamentally for welfare recipients, in a lot of cases, that's the equivalent of what the middle class who would be getting this, uh, their actual salaries, right? A lot mm -hmm. of these welfare recipients aren't working or could, could only work a few hours, whatever the case may be. So that's their, you know, hourly rate, so to speak, or what they make. It's not a job, but that's that's their baseline. Just like if I work, you know, if you work at a, I don't know, as a waitress somewhere, you're getting the $1,000 a month on top of your salary. So wouldn't stacking it uh, for welfare recipients give them that extra padding to potentially get them off welfare where they it can potentially, It potentially would, but I'm reminding you that welfare misses so many people and the way it's set up is humiliating and, and, and has stigma and it, it basically sucks. Uh, and it creates these cliffs. It creates work disincentives. You know, Republicans are not wrong when they talk about work disincentives. They're, they're common solutions of just gutting welfare in and of itself aren't, you know, very morally conscionable. But replacing it with something better would be. So if you're, I, I talk to hundreds and thousands, thousands of people around the country about their specific situations. And I met plenty of people who say, you know, I made $2 too much one week at my job. And I lost my food stamps. I lost 50 bucks, you know. And, and it's like, why did you do that? And it's like, well, I work as a home health aide, and the people I work for need me. So this person's integrity hurt them. We have a system that says it's in your best interest. It's smarter not to work. If you take a part-time job, you'll get off your welfare or your unemployment. And if that falls through in a week, then it might be a month before you can get on your unemployment or your welfare again. And, you know, what do you do in that time? You have to stay poor to prevent being destitute. Um, 
in terms of stacking, the one thing about UBI that's very different than how welfare or the labor market works is it's unconditional to not only your income, it's unconditional to how much time you give to someone. It's You get it before you spend any time on anything. This is the main difference between UBI and a jobs guarantee, where a jobs guarantee, you do have a livable income if you have a jobs guarantee job, but you're also, you have to put 40 hours a week into it or whatever, how many hours a week before you can have that. And what if you have a circumstance where you have a, a startup business you're trying to start or you have a sick parent at home or, you know, there's all these sorts of things that to a certain level, to a survival level, should be taken care of unconditionally. Right. And time is time is money and time is our greatest currency that people don't really seem to understand. Mm -hmm. And do you see any uh, validity in arguments if everybody gets a thousand dollars a month? I mean, we are a capitalist system, so couldn't couldn't the supply side just raise prices? It's kind of strange to me. So first of all, one thing is m almost everyone who proposes a UBI does not propose direct direct uh, deficit spending funding of UBI. Like the modern monetary theorists kind of seem to project that onto it, where it's um, they're they're assuming we're gonna it's a three trillion dollar plan. We're just gonna put three trillion dollars into the economy. Everyone's gonna get twelve thousand dollars extra, so we'll have we'll deal with inflation just based on the amount of money in, in supply. Why are we giving money to the to Bill Gates? Uh, but in truth, and if you um, and people can check out this website I created called ubicalculator.com that breaks down how different possible plans could be funded. In truth. A smartly funded UBI program, in, including Andrew Yang's to some degree, is essentially a wealth redistribution. It's or a wealth pre-distribution, however you want to think of it. But it's taking money that's being funneled up to the rich more so than it should be, is the argument, and making sure everyone gets a certain amount as sort of a share. That's why Andrew Yang calls it a dividend. I, a lot of people propose calling it a dividend. Um, so that's one thing: is you're not necessarily adding money to the economy. And if you talk to the modern monetary theorists, they'll say, you know, you can you can add money to the economy without worrying about, you know, runaway inflation, as lo so long as that money that's being added to the economy is justified, basically justifiable as an investment. If it's going to bring in as much productive capacity to the economy, as much goods and services as can be bought by that money, then you're not going to see prices inflate because we have enough money for the things it's buying, right? So. Um, it happens to be one of the issues I have with Andrew Yang's plan is that it currently still has too much deficit spending. Andrew Yang's plan right now, if you look at ubicalculator.com, um, it, it, for the sake of helping, I think, too many people in the economy get extra money through the program, something like 93% of people would, would come out ahead. Um, he ends up with over a trillion dollars in deficit spending, whereas a... UBI of the size and and scope of his, um, by the by the most popular and current estimates, would you could justify like 800 billion to 900 billion probably in deficit spending based on economic stimulus, based on you know how much we'll save on less people going to the hospital, going to jail, being poor. Um, so he has a little too much. Now the other argument with people just raising prices and and runaway costs is it sort of seems to presume that we're gonna do UBI in a vacuum like just end all government and all regulation and all competition and all mon anti-monopoly and and just give everyone cash and then everyone's gonna be super exploitable but there's there's no one pushing UBI that says we gotta stop pushing for rent control or we gotta allow monopoly you know and then if we if we claim to believe to some degree in in free markets to the extent that we can regulate them to be free markets, then there's always going to be someone that can undercut. And the cost of goods are going to be based on supply and demand. They're going to be based on the cost of production so that the company that most effectively gets whatever product it is to the consumer um, with you know, some acceptable amount of profit margin is going to be the one that gets the business. Mm -hmm. So someone who just triples their prices because they perceive that more people have money is not going to get that business and they're gonna go out of business. Right, you know, one thing that I don't really think is about the dollars and cents of this, but more about the mindset, and I know you're not on as like a, you know, 
campaign per- person for um, Yang, but since he's kind of nationally brought this to the forefront, one thing that kind of has turned me off about uh, Yang, and I would ask him about this, if UBI is a good thing, and I'm for UBI, this kind of Armageddon mentality that he puts out there, that like automation is inevitable, there's nothing we could do, uh, we're going to have a, potentially a jobless economy in, in a decade or so, if if that's tr- if that's kind of the attitude out of the gate, which I'm not saying that's your attitude, but that's kind of how he talks, $12,000 a year is not enough if people can't get jobs. It's just not. So yep. how do you combat that? Again, I know you're not specifically here to advocate for Yang's UBI, but just UBI in general. But how do you – just giving people $12,000 a year if the main problem is robots are going to replace us all – Nobody could live off that. Mm-hmm. So um, I, I have a few thoughts on this. Uh, the whole Armageddon automation thing is, I think, a very valid concern. And it's definitely more where Andrew Yang comes at it from, at least to start. And my take is that he's basically playing to what's working. So the, the sexy tech side of things is an attention grabber. But, I, but, a- I, but I'm telling you, it's not only, like, anecdotally, my older brother, love him, but he's one of these hedge fund people. I give him shit. And he's really smart, and he's like, dude, I mean, it's not out of the question that you might start seeing some some specific types of doctors replaced. because yeah. uh, Oh, it's sh- totally true. Yeah. It's to- like radiologists. I mean, it's it's not just you know, people in, man- in manufacturing either. It's people all the way up into legal and doctor and mm-hmm. And it's not such a, so much a thing as like these specific jobs will be cut, but you start cutting lots of tasks from lots of jobs and different people can, you, know, you need fewer people. And that could either mean fewer people are working or it could mean the same amount of us are working less and, and getting a lot more done, right? Then that's what tech is supposed to do for us. Um, the question is, you know, we have to unchain ourselves from this, you must work 40 hours plus a week at a specific company in a specific way when we're going through dramatic changes in the way our economy and labor market works you know it's i don't know the exact numbers but the gig work is taking over contract work is taking over you know used to be like my parents worked at four different places in their lives i were i'll work at four different places in a year you know um and so we don't have those benefits we don't we're all like little discrete units that move around and have to protect ourselves and it's not under these big structures so we need a system that makes us each individually uh resilient with with our own portable agency and source of income that can get us through as we adapt now no one's saying that this is going to be easy it could be like these questions of what's going to happen in the labor market what is going to happen to the humankind's sense of purpose when robots gradually get better and better than us at everything? Like, what's there left for us to do? You know, I think these are very serious issues, and we're going to have to face these no matter what we do. But I would rather face it with a population that's not, you know, 50% of people in destitute poverty, mm-hmm. people that can at least get by while we're figuring out what the hell we're going to do next together. Mm-hmm. And I think I've heard Andrew talk about that too, where it's like, this is not the solution. This is putting us in a place where we can find the solutions. And it's true with every one of the progressive causes that you and I care about, like climate change, you know? How many people wanted to go to Standing Rock or other pipeline protests, but, you know, I gotta, I gotta work at my job, I, whatever. You know, I gotta make sure my kids are okay. There were like four cops that stepped off the line at Standing Rock and quit their jobs because it was morally repugnant to them. How many more wanted to? Right. You know, how many more really hated the fact that they were spraying freezing water in people's faces, but they're like, I don't have any other transferable skills. No one's ever going to give me a police job again, and I got to feed my kids. It's the same argument for Medicare for all. How many people want to leave their job? Exactly. I think so. I make the case all the time. Like UBI is not in a vacuum. People, and it, it disheartens me that the progressives for Bernie or Warren or whatever, it keeps getting places. It's like it's UBI or right. And I've been making the case, and I've been trying to get it out there that it's UBI and. I just wrote a thing, a Dear Bernie letter that maybe people will eventually see, that uh, basically walks through how every single one of his policies would be strengthened by a UBI, including Medicare for all, because cash is the best preventative medicine. They say doctors will tell you that in Canada. It's like, it's better here, but 
I wish we could prescribe cash because poverty is the leading cause of a lot of illness, mm -hmm. you know? Uh, jobs guarantee, it's like, it's super important to invest in these radical green new G deal infrastructure build outs and all the jobs we need to do to make it happen. But we need to make sure that people who aren't in that system um, are still okay and not on the crappy welfare we have now. And then the people who join that system are absolutely doing it because they want to. And we're not trying to find a job for 50 million people who have no other choice. We're trying to find jobs for 10 million people who really want to do something and help, mm -hmm. you know? And it's, it, you can take it down through all of the policies. You're getting money out of politics, we got to get rid of Citizens United. We got to do a lot of things. But what could be more powerful in the short term than having everyone comfortable enough to give 27 bucks not just to their flagship candidate like Bernie or Yang, whoever they're in love with, but their local candidates and get involved and get engaged and have like the ability to look up and get involved. Mm -hmm. So U UBI is something that I think could strengthen everyone's platform and people mock it like it's UBI advocates have a hammer and all they see is nails. But it's not a hammer. It's uh, The thing about cash is it's the most diverse and useful tool there is in the world because it can literally be anything. And so it's just power. And you're giving it to every single human. So it's at a fundamental level, all UBI is, is power to the people. That's it. I, I, I think I'm... Uh I think I'm understanding you. Uh, I definitely think Yang could actually explain if he would go on a little bit more in depth like you. Because I think Yang, in some of the interviews I've seen, it doesn't come off like UBI and. It has come off like UBI or. But mm. I'm, I'm more on the UBI and uh, side of things. Because when you're talking about human rights, which we talked about in the beginning, it's really UBI is human right at economic security. I mean, that's really what it seems to me. Um, so that's great. And you said we could expect, hopefully, if all goes well, uh, your documentary out in 2020? Uh, yeah, that's the plan. We, we um, just got another bump of funding in, so we're, uh, we're launching into the edit. Uh, we're putting together a pilot. We're expecting to start figuring out our distribution in the, in the coming months. And, um, yeah, all systems seem to be go. And um, I would really encourage anyone who's interested in, in just also knowing right now, today, how different plans would affect them and their household, uh, go to ubicalculator.com and just play around, share it with people. Um, I think that's, that's the main thing that I saw missing, more so than just human rights messaging, is, is what that means in terms of getting something passed. Is, if you're going to pass a UBI, something so populist and so fundamentally different as UBI in our political reality, it has to be a grassroots movement. It cannot be think tanks. It cannot be you know celebrities or tech billionaires that are leading the charge. It can't be any one person. It has to be massively popular and demanded by the people. And the only way to get that is to get a, a real fair awareness of it out to the public and let them learn for themselves and decide for themselves if, if it works for them. So yeah, ubicalculator.com will show the money behind it and Bootstraps will show the, uh, the human nature behind it. And uh, I definitely want to have you back once, once this documentary is out. So thank you, my friend, Conrad Shaw. Keep up the fight. Thanks, man. All right. Hope you enjoyed that last video. Hop on over to statuscoup.com where you can sign up for our email list and become a member for as low as five to $10 a month. Membership is how we grow. That's statuscoup.com slash join. And remember, join our email list so we can grow the revolution with you. Oh.